by Henry James Read by Algie Pug We are scattered now, the friends of the late Mr. Oliver Offord, but whenever we chance to meet, I think we are conscious of a certain esoteric respect for each other. Yes, you too have been in Arcadia, we seem not too grumpily to allow. When I passed the house in Mansfield Street, I remember that Arcadia was there. I don't know who has it now, and don't want to know. It's enough to be so sure that if I should ring the bell, there should be no such luck for me as that Brooksmith should open the door. Mr. Offord, the most agreeable, the most attaching of bachelors, was a retired diplomatist, living on his pension, and on something of his own over and above, a good deal confined, by his infirmities, to his fireside, and delighted to be found there any afternoon in the year, from five o'clock on, by such visitors as Brooksmith allowed to come up. Brooksmith was his butler, and his most intimate friend, to whom we all stood, or I should say sat, in the same relation in which the subject of the sovereign finds himself to the Prime Minister. By having been, for years, in foreign lands, the most delightful Englishman any one has ever known, Mr. Offord had, in my opinion, rendered signal service to his country. But I suppose he had been too much liked, liked even by those who didn't like it, so that, as people of that sort never get titles or dotations for the horrid things they've not done, his principal reward was simply that we went to see him. Oh, we went perpetually, and it was not our fault if he was not overwhelmed with this particular honour. Any visitor who came once came again. To come merely once was a slight nobody, I'm sure, had ever put upon him. His circle, therefore, was essentially composed of habitués, who were habitués for each other, as well as for him, as those of a happy salon should be. I remember vividly every element of the place, down to the intensely Londonish look of the grey opposite houses, in the gap of the white curtains of the high windows, and the exact spot where, on a particular afternoon, I put down my teacup for Brooksmith, lingering an instant, to gather it up as if he were plucking a flower. Mr. Offord's drawing-room was indeed Brooksmith's garden, his pruned and tended human parterre, and if we all flourished there and grew well in our places, it was largely owing to his supervision. Many persons have heard much, though most have doubtless seen little, of the famous institution of the Salon, and many are born to the depression of knowing that this finest flower of social life refuses to bloom where the English tongue is spoken. The explanation is usually that our women have not the skill to cultivate it, the art to direct through a smiling land, between suggestive shores, a sinuous stream of talk. My affectionate, my pious memory of Mr. Offord contradicts this induction only, I fear, more insidiously to confirm it. The sallow and slightly smoked drawing-room, in which he spent so large a portion of the last years of his life, certainly deserved the distinguished name, but on the other hand it couldn't be said at all to owe its stamp to any intervention throwing into relief the fact that there was no Mrs. Offord. The dear man had, indeed, at the most, been capable of one of those sacrifices to which women are deemed peculiarly apt. He had recognised, under the influence, in some degree, it is true, of physical infirmity, that if you wish people to find you at home, you must manage not to be out. He had, in short, accepted the truth, which many dabblers in the social art are slow to learn, that you must really, as they say, take a line, and that the only way as yet discovered of being at home is to stay at home. Finally his own fireside had become a summary of his habits. Why should he ever have left it? Since this would have been leaving what was notoriously pleasantest in London, the compact, charmed cluster, thinning away indeed into casual couples, 
round the fine old last-century chimney-piece, which, with the exception of the remarkable collection of miniatures, was the best thing the place contained. Mr. Offord wasn't rich. He had nothing but his pension, and the use for life of the somewhat superannuated house. When I am reminded by some opposed discomfort of the present hour how perfectly we were all handled there, I ask myself once more what had been the secret of such perfection. One had taken it for granted at the time, for anything that is supremely good produces more acceptance than surprise. I felt we were all happy, but I didn't consider how our happiness was managed. And yet there were questions to be asked questions that strike me as singularly obvious now that there's nobody to answer them. Mr. Offord had solved the insoluble. He had, without feminine help, save in the sense that ladies were dying to come to him, and that he saved the lives of several, established a salon. But I might have guessed that there was a method in his madness, a law in his success. He hadn't hit it off by a mere fluke. There was an art in it all, and how was the art so hidden? Who, indeed, if it had come to that, was the occult artist? Launching this inquiry the other day, I had already got hold of the tale of my reply. I was helped by the very wonder of some of the conditions that came back to me, those that used to seem as natural as sunshine in a fine climate. How was it, for instance, that we never were a crowd, never either too many or too few. Always the right people with the right people. There must really have been no wrong people at all, always coming and going, never sticking fast nor overstaying, yet never popping in or out with an indecorous familiarity. How was it that we all sat where we wanted, and moved when we wanted, and met whom we wanted, and escaped when we wanted, joining, according to the accident of inclination, the general circle of falling in with a single talker on a convenient sofa. Why were all the sofas so convenient, the accidents so happy, the talkers so ready, the listeners so willing, the subjects presented to you in a rotation as quickly foreordained as the courses at dinner, a dearth of topics, would have been as unheard of as a lapse in the service. These speculations couldn't fail to lead me to the fundamental truth that Brooksmith had been somehow at the bottom of the mystery. If he hadn't established the salon, at least he had carried it on. Brooksmith, in short, was the artist. We felt this covertly at the time, without formulating it, and were conscious, as an ordered and prosperous community, of his even-handed justice, all untainted with flunkeyism. He had none of that vulgarity. His touch was infinitely fine. The delicacy of it was clear to me on the first occasion my eyes rested, as they were so often to rest again, on the domestic revealed in the turbid light of the street, by the opening of the house door. I saw on the spot that though he had plenty of school, he carried it without arrogance. He had remained articulate and human. L'école anglaise, Mr. Offord, used laughingly to call him, when, later on, it happened more than once that we had some conversation about him. But I remember accusing Mr. Offord of not doing him quite ideal justice. That he wasn't one of the giants of the school, however, was admitted by my old friend, who really understood him perfectly, and was devoted to him, as I shall show, which doubtless poor Brooksmith had himself felt to his cost, when his value in the market was originally determined. The utility of his class in general is estimated by the foot and the inch, and poor Brooksmith had only about five feet three to put into circulation. He acknowledged the inadequacy of this provision, and I am sure was penetrated with the everlasting fitness of the relation between service and stature. If he had been Mr. Offord, he certainly would have found Brooksmith wanting, 
and indeed the laxity of his employer on this score was one of the many things he had had to condone, and to which he had, at last, indulgently adapted himself. I remember the old man saying to me, Oh, my servants, if they could live with me a fortnight, they could live with me forever. But it's the first fortnight that tries them. It was in the first fortnight, for instance, that Brooksmith had had to learn that he was exposed to being addressed as My dear fellow, and My poor child. Strange and deep must such a probation have been to him, and he doubtless emerged from it tempered and purified. This was written, to a certain extent, in his appearance, in his spare, brisk, little person, in his cloistered white face, and extraordinarily polished hair, which told a responsibility, looked as if it were kept up to the same high standard as the plate, in his small, clear, anxious eyes, even in the permitted, though not exactly encouraged, tuft on his chin. He thinks me rather bad, but I've broken him in, and now he likes the place. He likes the company, said the old man. I embraced this fully after I had become aware that Brook Smith's main characteristic was a deep and shy refinement, though I remember I was rather puzzled when, on another occasion, Mr. Offord remarked, What he likes is the talk, mingling in the conversation. I was conscious that I had never seen Brooksmith permit himself this freedom, but I guessed in a moment that what Mr. Offord alluded to was a participation more intense than any speech could have represented, that of being perpetually present on a hundred legitimate pretexts, errands, necessities, and breathing the very atmosphere of criticism, the famous criticism of life. "'Quite an education, sir, isn't it, sir?' he said to me one day at the foot of the stairs when he was letting me out, and I have always remembered the words and the tone as the first sign of the quickening drama of poor Brooksmith's fate. It was indeed an education, but to what was this sensitive young man of thirty-five, of the servile class, being educated? Practically and inevitably, for the time, to companionship, to the perpetual, the even exaggerated reference and appeal of a person brought to dependence by his time of life and his infirmities, and always addicted, moreover, this was the exaggeration, to the art of giving you pleasure by letting you do things for him. There were certain things Mr. Offord was capable of pretending he liked you to do even when he didn't. This, I mean, if he thought you liked them. If it happened that you didn't, either, which was rare, yet might be. Of course there were cross-purposes, but Brooke Smith was there to prevent their going very far. This was precisely the way he acted as moderator. He averted misunderstandings, or cleared them up. He had been capable, strange as it may appear, of acquiring for this purpose an insight into the French tongue which was often used at Mr. Offord's, for besides being habitual to most of the foreigners, and they were many, who haunted the place or arrived with letters, letters often requiring a little worried consideration, of which Brooksmith always had cognizance, it had really become the primary language of the master of the house. I don't know if all the malentendus were in French, but almost all the explanations were, and this didn't a bit prevent Brooksmith's following them. I know Mr. Orford used to read passages to him from Montaigne and Saint-Simon, for he read perpetually when alone, when they were alone, that is, and Brooksmith was always about. Perhaps you'll say no wonder Mr. Orford's butler regarded him as rather mad. However, if I'm not sure what he thought about Montaigne, I'm convinced he admired Saint-Simon. A certain feeling for letters must have rubbed off on him from the mere handling of his master's books, which he was always carrying to and fro and putting back in their places. Mm -hmm.